Thanks to all of you for coming, and uh, thanks to, to the New York Review for uh, co-sponsoring this event. I think there's much to, to commend this topic, uh, this book, and this panel. Uh, Richard's written a beautifully researched, very elegant book, which uh, I can't wait to ask you what your conclusion is, uh, because at the end of the book, uh, there isn't exactly a conclusion. It's very haiku-like, zen-like in its ending. Uh, but the topic of the triangle of the US, Japan, and uh, China is, of course, one which is sort of critical to just about everything that, that's going on in Asia today and, and, and relates, of course, to the Korea question. And it's a great panel, uh, you will see. Uh, no further words need to be said about it. So let's, let's start. So Richard, I wanted to just let you uh, discuss your book a bit, but maybe tell us what was the itch you were scratching when you wrote, and what actually do you think we ought to take away from your, your sort of historical uh, uh, narrative of these three countries interacting? Um, thanks. Thanks, Orville. Um, thanks, Susan and Ian. Thanks to the Asia Society for putting this on. I mean, I confess openly I don't really have a conclusion. And in fact, I think there's an old idea about books that you should sort of work from the dust jacket backwards. In other words, sort of, you know, write everything down and then expand from that point onward so you have a sort of consistent theme running through the whole book. I mean, having lived in both Japan and China for a long time, I was basically just interested in the relationship the bilateral relationship and the story, much more than uh, anything else. Um, for example, if you go into a bookshop in, in the US, you'll see there's a cottage industry of books on the US and China, the US and Middle East. Uh, in the UK, for example, there's a cottage industry of books on the UK and France, France and Germany and the like. Um, uh, you'll find very little on Japan and China, and it's uh, a very consequential relationship. Um, <clears throat> I hope I don't mean that in a kind of eat your broccoli type fashion, um, but... Um, no, your uh, book, I mean, it yeah. isn't eating broccoli at well, all. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, for example, if you think about the war with ISIS, one thing we don't worry about in, in relation to the war with ISIS is the impact on the caliphate's GDP. We don't even care about the impact on the oil price anymore. Um, uh, uh, but in the case of Japan and China, if there were to be any conflict there, that's the entire global economy goes through these two countries, along with Taiwan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And the second way it's consequential is, imagine if the Japan and China actually did get on. And if they did get on, then frankly, there would be little role for the US in East Asia. There'd be little uh, to see of this, this kind of Pax Americana that we see these days. Um, and uh, um, uh, you know, the whole sort of post-war architecture that we've lived with for 70 years and that has sustained and underpinned the Asian economic miracle wouldn't really exist. Um, but of course they do get on. They don't get on. And the US is still there. And the US is kind of um, uh, uh, stuck there in a way, alongside Japan um, uh, as a treaty ally. Um, and of course that hinders US relations with China. Um, I, guess, I guess I had a couple of main, main themes to the, to the book. The first is to try and explain why they don't get on. One of the odd things about Japan and China, even though they've kind of raged against Western countries quite rightly over the last hundred years to be treated as equals, um, and with all the sort of racially or racist policies that towards uh, East Asian nations over time, they've never really been able to teach, treat each other as equals. One's always been on top of the other. Um, that's one point. There's the history wars. Um, you know, you don't have to look uh, beyond the US to see how history can still permeate daily politics. Uh, that's obviously up front here as well. But it's quite striking, uh, I think, in East Asia um, how the history wars um, uh, still uh, are used to manipulate domestic politics, internal domestic politics in a major way. But I've tried not to write so much about the history wars as the history of the history wars and explain uh, uh, how that uh, uh, takes place. Um, and I guess then there's the US. You, don't, um, you can't write about Japan and China unless you write about the US as well. Uh, the US is Japan's indispensable ally. Um, it, 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 uh, as I mentioned before, it basically set up the post-war architecture in the form of the San Francisco Treaty in the early 50s. Um, 
Uh, I think, and I think this is actually an area that needs a lot more work, but I think China wants to unravel that. It doesn't accept. China has benefited enormously from uh, the US-made world in East Asia, but quite naturally, uh, it doesn't really want. It's strong enough, it thinks, or starting to be strong enough now uh, to manage the region itself or to start to manage. It doesn't want the US to leave quickly. I think China prefers the US to kind of go into sort of bourgeois decline, if you like, uh, and just to sort of slowly ease out of the region. To go quickly would be destabilizing. Um, but that's a big dilemma for the US. Does the US stand its ground, pour enormous resources into trying to push back against China, contain China, whatever you, however you want to talk about it? Uh, or does the US slowly leave? Um, and on that point, I won't go on too much. You asked me about my conclusion, <laughs> and one person hanging over everything as he hangs over all our daily lives here is Mr. Trump. And the, he, he gave an interview to, I think as you know, many people in this room knows, no, Trump sort of came to, uh, you know, his political awakening was in the 80s during the Japanese trade wars. You know, he's very anti-Japanese. And um, he gave an interview to The Economist magazine in late 2015. And this is a section that actually wasn't published in the magazine at the time. And he was asked about what he'd been saying on the campaign trail about, you know, you know, the, you know why shouldn't, you know, he'd been talking about Japan going nuclear, you know, no problem with that. South Korea can have nukes as well. Why not? Uh, and the reporter asked him about, um, you know, but why, you know, isn't the US going to defend China? Japan. And, uh, sorry, Japan, I'm sorry. Um, and first of all, he had a rant about um, what he'd just seen in Los Angeles about all these uh, Japanese cars pouring off the container ships. And he said, I'm saying to myself, we send them beef. It's a tiny fraction. And by the way, they don't even want it. As always with Mr. Trump, he often hits the nail on the head. Um, but anyway, he went through his rant about, you know, oh, by the way, I love China, I love Japan, all that sort of stuff. And then he was asked again, but, you know, what about the US, you know, commitment to defend Japan? Uh, and he said, um, if we step back, the Japanese will protect themselves very well. He said, remember when Japan used to beat China routinely in wars? You know that, right? Japan used to beat China all the time. Why are we defending them at all? And so we get to the, the point now where Trump, of course, is in the White House. Uh, the Japanese foreign ministry, I think, uh, the Japanese naturally re need reassurance. I think the Japanese foreign ministry did a count the other day of how many times uh, the US administration under Trump had reassured Japan of the US's uh, commitment to defend it. And I think they, they had done it 28 times, probably but 30 by now. And it sort of occurred to me, if you have to ask your partner 28 times whether or not they love you, uh, it, you, you probably start to worry. Sort of like China asking Japan to apologize. Yeah, that's right. The, um, so that's my conclusion, really. And it's not much of a conclusion, but in some, you know, you can make up any scenario you want for China based on this, that, and other facts. And the same goes in, in East Asia as well. But the, my broader conclusion is that the old Pax Americana is unraveling, maybe quickly with North Korea, maybe slowly with Japan and China. But one way or another, the next 20 years is not going to look like the past 20 years. OK, so now maybe before we just have a little discussion and throw it open to you all, let's just let Susan and Ian give us some uh, thoughts about uh, their having read this book and how they're looking at this, this topic. Susan? Well, before I do that, though, I just have to observe that uh, Donald Trump, during the campaign and in the debates, he often would say, oh, yes, they're eating our lunch, they're taking advantage of us. And then he'd say, China, Japan, right. and Mexico. Yeah, that's the, and, and I thought he stuck back in the time when we were worried that Japan was going to surpass us economically, the Japanese model and everything. He just, and he just blurs them all together in his mind. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. But I'm really <coughs> glad you wrote this book. It's a terrific book. And I agree with you 
completely that the China-Japan relationship is really the critical uh, hinge on which peace and stability in Asia rests. And um, quite a few years ago, a very senior Chinese diplomat who um, had, I had dinner with him, and he asked me a question, just one-on-one. -on -one. He said, what kind of role in Asia is the, uh, is the United States prepared to have China play? And I thought for a minute, and then I said, it really all depends on China-Japan relations. Because if China and Japan can find a way to get along, then, just as you said, really, the U.S. role is so much less critical. And that's, I think that's actually in U.S. interests. The key for us should be a peaceful, stable Asia, not exactly what the American role is. So if China can find a way to assure Japan that it can be trusted, that they can get along, I think that's good for the United States. I know in your book you mentioned, I think, that uh, was it Nixon who said that it's good for the United States to have them at each other. At each other, mm -hmm. but I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, uh, you know, uh, and to have them at each other as we have had it since the mid 90s um, is not a good thing. Mm -hmm for the United States. And I think your book vividly uh, demonstrates that with uh, the history you uh, relate to us. And my takeaways from the book, just very briefly, are that China-Japan relations are more fluid than you might think today. When you go back and you look at the history, um, they're not there's not some determinism here, <laughs> some international relations determinism or some historical determinism that they have to be in conflict. And there were periods when they weren't. And uh, the second thing is that the, their policies toward one another are so intertwined with their domestic politics. And you tell lots of uh, examples of that from both sides. So that if it's a great way of uh, slicing into domestic politics in China and in Japan, how intertwined their relations are with, you know, the economic interests, the security interests within the LDP, especially the factions within the LDP, the uh, on the Chinese side, uh, the felt need to demonstrate strength in the party to the other elites and to the public by taking Japan as a foil that you see starting with the more insecure leaders like Jiang Zemin. And then history. I also don't think history is destiny here because you show that the Chinese can play up history or they can play down history. And it's really up to Chinese leaders how they want to play it. And we saw Mao and Deng, they didn't play it up, but Jiang Zemin did play it up. Who kind of played it down? Things were peaceful, more or less peaceful between 2005, 2010. So the whole situation is more amenable to political leadership than I think I mean, that's what I take away from your book. Um, and, uh, and we have seen a lot of fluidity. So that raises the question that you just mentioned again, is can they actually improve their relations in the future? Um, Xi Jinping right now is, I think, kind of trying to cool, I wouldn't say warm it up, but stabilize the situation with Japan? Is it possible that a leader with the power of a Xi Jinping, that he might actually improve relations with Japan? Yeah. Well, I think one of the great 
merits of the book, and it's, it's much less usual than, than people might think, is that it's so even-handed towards um, mm-hmm. uh, all countries under discussion. It's one of the professional <coughs> quirks of uh, people who of China experts that they take on the prejudices of their subject, and they tend to think about Japan and the Japanese in the way that the Chinese do. And the same is true of Japan hands, who tend to have views on China that uh, they take over from, their, from, from, from the Japanese. And uh, your book, I think, has the great merit uh, that it doesn't do that. And, and I think that's, as I said, I think it's very unusual. My um, s- sense of, the, of Pax Americana and the Sino-Japanese relationship is that it's facing the sort of dilemma that um, aging empires very often do, which is that um, you have an em- empire and you have colonial peoples. And the, the question comes up, when should the colonial people be uh, able or allowed to rule themselves? And uh, the argument in late empires is always, oh, well, yes, of course, one day they, they will be able to do that, but not for a while, because if we leave now, there'll be chaos and mayhem and so on. And uh, the problem with that is, of course, that as long as the empire exists... Uh, they won't be ready to rule themselves. And the only way that they will be ready eventually is for the empire to seize. But you do often get chaos and mayhem as a result. So it's a dilemma to which there is no very good solution. I think probably Pax Americana and East Asia has, is something that eventually should make way for uh, an Asian solution where Asians take care of these things themselves. Um, but as long as the U.S. is there, in some ways it, pr- it hinders that process because the U.S. is there as the kind of the teacher who has to keep the children in order. And as long as the teacher is there, the children won't grow up to take care of it themselves. On the other hand, if the U.S. Uh, retreats, especially if they retreat too, too soon, as you say, uh, there will probably be all kinds of problems. Now, I'm not quite as optimistic as Susan is on uh, how the Chinese and the Japanese are going to get on. And I'm not sure reassurances and talking to them and telling them that they should be adult about these things and get on and so on is really going to do the trick because there is a real problem there, which is that Japan is a democracy with its flaws, like most democracies. It is an open society, and China manifestly is not. And so Japan would be faced with the problem that inevitably they will be dominated by a power that is deeply unsympathetic to, to their interests and to an open society. And I, I think a kind of a, a tension, at least, uh, one hopes without violence, but a tension will be there inevitably. And it's not a question of goodwill and so on. It is a question of Japan having to face uh, a dominant power simply because of its size and, and, and so on, uh, that is a, a huge problem for them. And so they have every reason to believe that the longer the, Uni- the United States stays there, uh, the better it is for them. On the other hand, in the, in the long, long run, it probably isn't. And that's not a very uh, a cogent conclusion either, but that's why I sim- sympathize with the way you ended your book. All you can say is the end and the story <laughs> continues. <laughs> Well, let, let's tease that out a little because I think, you know, the, the thing that I think uh, y- y- that you just uh, hinted at, Ian, is sort of undeniably true. What's really at work here, it seems to me, is, is a different political systems and different values. It isn't just country A and country B, you know, you could have one or the other and they're both sort of equally as, as acceptable and soluble in the global order. So I think that, you know, this is not just Japan's problem. It's Korea's problem. It's America's problem. You have China, and China seems to be now moving in a direction which is more divergent than convergent with uh, Western-style democracies. So, Ian, let me ask you, how do you think that uh, has played out, is playing out, and should play out? What's the remedy for that, that incredible contradiction. Well, I think the problem for the U.S. is is perhaps less acute because it doesn't matter so much if powers have different kind of politics or different political systems and different values if there is a rough balance of power. I mean, you can live with with another power Mm -hmm. even if they have a system you you deeply hate. 
uh, you can come to some kind of an agreement, and as the Soviet Union did with the United States. Mm -hmm. It's much harder for, a play, for Japan uh, in a region where there is this one huge colossus, which is always, been, it is the Middle Kingdom, it's not called that for nothing, I mean, it, and that's going to stay, and China will be the dominant power in, in East and Southeast Asia, there's nothing much you can do about that. Trying to uh, contain them and so on, uh, in the end, is probably a mug's game. But there is no way that Japan alone can balance that. Mm -hmm. Ideally, uh, I've written that before, so I don't want to bore people who might have re read that, but ideally, I think, uh, what you would need is a kind of uh, East and Southeast Asian version of NATO, where you have Southeast Asia and East Asian societies who form an alliance that could balance China. And the problem with that is that the only country that could lead that would be Japan. And neither, m m neither many Asians nor the Japanese themselves really want this. Yeah. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, we're faced with the same thing, that Germany is clearly the dominant power. People don't really care anymore. I mean, even when the German soccer team wins the World Cup, we don't really mind that, and it's full of poles, and it, they're fine, they're cool. <laughs> but nobody feels that really yet about Japan. <laughs> so, yeah. so, Richard, respond. Well, I think that's, I mean, even if Japan were to lead a sort of uh, Asian-style NATO, that would be a radical change anyway. Because as Alina, uh, uh, Ian alluded to, um, you know, Japan has been like the sort of 46-year-old who won't move out of its parent, his parents' house. You know, it just, uh, it won't go out and make its way in the world alone. Um, and it's got to the point now, such as the balance of power with China, if this were, were to be talked about 10, 20 years ago, it might have been different. But in no way is a Sinocentric uh, order good for Japan. Um, um, and even if it were to lead a NATO-style uh, set of uh, alliances or security pact in Asia, it's doubtful that would be enough to balance uh, uh, China even then. And of course, look at the rest of Asia. You know, is really Japan going to lead a, a bunch of uh, countries like uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, um, can they all be reliable partners um, uh, against China? Uh, I, I doubt it very much, actually. Well, there's India, too. There's India. Well, the, what is happening now, the US and, you know, alliances in Asia used to be hubs and spokes, quite separate sort of um, arrangements with each other, in part because Asian countries, US relations with different Asian countries were much better between Asian countries themselves. Now we're moving to a much more kind of network arrangement. Um, a response to China, it's Japan, India, it's India, Australia, uh, it's Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, the Philippines. So that's evolving and that's one of the most interesting thing that's ha things that are happening because if the US does become weaker, other countries have to step up, basically. They can't just sort of cower. Right, and I, I have to say I don't agree that we're going to have a recreation of the China-centered hierarchy in Asia because it's, it, it's not possible because China is surrounded by 20 neighbors and many of them are big, uh, substantial countries in their own right with a lot of economic power and substantial military power as well. And that includes not just uh, Japan and Australia and um, India, but even Korea. You know, South Korea is a major <coughs> economic and military power too. And Indonesia is a big country. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, I'm a little more optimistic about balancing and in fact trying to integrate China into some kind of Asian system uh, in which the U.S. plays less of a role. I think the problem you point to about Japan's leadership of such an effort is um, that Japan has made proposals. They weren't welcomed that heartily by other Asian countries. Well, and, plus, plus they weren't welcomed by the U.S. The U.S. knocked right. a few of them on the head as well. Right, but, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the fact that Korea and <coughs> Japan can't get along is a huge problem. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, but in that's the a soluble problem. And I think it, 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 even if there was some kind of arrangement that would, in, an Asian arrangement that would include China, you'd still be stuck with the same problem because if it included China, China would still dominate. There's well, no, economically, well, and, and it is the. Um, the uh, number one trading partner of almost all of those Asian neighbors. And mm. so that is, means that China is at the center of an increasingly integrated Asian economy. So let's look for a moment. I mean, why is it when you can build a very strong case that it's in Japan's interest and China's interest just to get along? The war is over, you know, and they have so many reasons to cooperate, collaborate, right. not only culturally, trade, mm -hmm. a lot of other reasons. So why isn't this happening? Why isn't that common interest recognized and sort of transubstantiated into policy and collaboration? Well, yes, I mean, in theory, if you're a Chinese strategist and you wanted to uh, diminish US power in East Asia, there's the best way to do that is to pull Japan away from the US, yeah. even one third of the way across. And um, they've never been able to do that. Now, why is that? Uh, it's almost like Japan is the kind of the bone in China's throat or something. But they, they just can't get out of their system. Um, it's, it's a bit emotional. And vice versa. Would yeah, you say? Well, it's become vice versa. But uh, I think it's. I think the story, in some ways, I mean, it's. I don't want to say you know, on the one hand, the other hand, and sit on the fence or something, but. Uh, I think in some ways it, it does, it is locked up in um, domestic politics in both countries, but in, in China's case, particularly uh, in China. You know, one reason why Chinese propaganda about Japan works is because it's based on facts, unlike other uh, Chinese propaganda. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the Nanjing massacre is not fake news. Uh, Japan did invade, it didn't advance into China, all that sort of thing. And we always have the, uh, the terrible bunch of Japanese revisionists who, you know, keep this argument going. As somebody, one of my colleagues in Australia said, you know, every time Japan apologises, somebody comes along and unapologises a few days later. So apologies have been basically uh, useless. But I really do think it's become such a weapon inside Chinese domestic politics. It's very hard for anybody to take a leadership role in China on Japan other than at the top right now in particular with, with the, a particularly powerful leader. Uh, you can't stick your neck out and call for better relations. For the propaganda department within the Communist Party, uh, if you want to mobilise the masses, there's no better way than giving Japan a good kick. Um, uh, it's one of the few areas, spaces in which people can protest um, in China. And I think it's proving very difficult um, to unwind that and particularly uh, when it's part of a broader set of post-war arrangements which China would like to unwind as well. And if you read what the Chinese leaders say, and also in popular culture, I mean, their view is Japan is relegated to a permanently junior role in Asia uh, as the loser of the war. In some respects, Japan's role is to do nothing, be inert. And I used to think, you know, that we have all this stuff about the old Chinese tributary system and all that sort of thing. And I used to think that was, you know, something that people would talk about on TED Talks and things. And I never really took much notice of it. But certainly, I think in other Asian countries, in Japan, they think that is China's mindset, that China will be on top and others can be junior partners as long as they behave. And that's not a good recipe for uh, mutual respect and, um, um, you know, stability. Well, that's why I think that the, 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 war, the um, history of the war, the wars of history uh, are very interesting and they're used and they're, so they're politically relevant, but it's not the heart of the problem. I mean, if you look at European history, um, in 1914, or before 1914, the elites of Germany and France and Russia and so on, they got on perfectly well. It's not a question of not getting on. I mean, they, they knew each other and so on. But the, what you did have is a problem of different powers jockeying for position to see who could dominate. And I think the Europeans have only solved it, so maybe not forever, but at least for in, in our lifetimes, by having a sort of uh, kind of European unity where sovereignty is pulled and all the rest of it, which was one way of keeping, keeping us safe from Germany because it embedded Germany in it. 
But I don't see how that can be done in East Asia because it only works in the EU because they're all democracies. A, a similar mm -hmm. arrangement in East Asia will not work with the China that not only probably does genuinely think that it should be top dog so just because, of it, because it's China and it's bigger and the rest of it, but it's not a democracy. So whatever the his, historical arguments and whatever the, the cultural aspects and so on are, this particular problem of who's going to be top, top dog in East and Southeast Asia um, is very difficult to solve, or it's going to go, continue to be a source of tension. So, Richard, how do you assess? I mean, uh, I, I sort of sense in reading your book and listening to you that you probably think the, the preponderance of burden for a bad relationship with Japan lies on China's side. And I'd like to ask all of you this, but, but what, what would you conclude having done this great recherche? You're putting my head on the chopping block with a question like that, of well, course, I once, the, uh, <laughs> once the Chinese internet bots you know, pl <laughs> translate the comments or something like that. Um, well, that's why I'm the question. Yeah, and you're the it's answer. your fault. Um, yeah. Well, I think, it, I, think, I think, you know, it's the politics of Japan inside China make it very difficult. There's a sort of a much bigger driver um, I think are uh, inside China holding uh, uh, Japan down. Um, uh, Japan, for all its thought, faults, um, is a much more open society. You can be for or against China there. Uh, people forget that a lot of the evidence of uh, Japanese war atrocities has been dug up by Japanese left wingers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's a different dynamic. Um, it's not all China's fault. I don't know whether I can fall back into a 70-30 formula or something like that. <laughs> the Chinese um, did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think one of China's big problems more broadly is the inability to seduce other countries, persuade, reassure, and the like. And that's a quality uh, of a great, great power. And I still don't think we've seen that. And I think also the other issue in China is China, China is still growing. It's becoming more powerful. Um, uh, when you're not only ascendant, but, it's, but still ascending, then it's rarely time to take a step back. Susan, let me ask you the same question. I mean, when you, you're a very sort of level-headed observer of these kinds of views. Well, I mean, you know, Ian's book, Comparing Japan and Germany, had a huge impact on me. And, um, you know, because your argument uh, is more about, not about apologies and things like that, but about the whole domestic society coming to grips with the wartime experience and educating successive generations to learn from it. And Germany's done an amazing job of doing that, and Japan hasn't. So that's the problem. But now it's, it's, it's probably too late to ever undertake that kind of effort mm. in Japan now. And, um, you know, and I think that is the problem for Japan in exercising leadership in Asia. And, you know, Susan, because do you think that Japan, any, there is a form of apology that Japan could make now no, that would satiate no, China? No, no, no. It's not about, I, I mean, I find the whole thing so distasteful because it's such a show. And if somebody forces you to say magic words, but pe people won't believe <clears throat> they're really sincere because they're just said in order to get the right response. They're not really coming from um, some sincere coming to grips uh, with the wartime responsibility. So, and, you know, you know, I'm not worried about Japan in the future, but I understand why other Asian countries, Korea and China, you know, uh, resent the fact that Japan has never really come to grips with his wartime mm -hmm. history. But on the other hand, your book shows how not every Chinese leader played the Japan card. Mm -hmm. You know, and Mao didn't, Deng Xiaoping didn't. Um, it really only started with Jiang Zemin. It's not that mm -hmm. long a history. Hu Jintao didn't do it 
as much. Hu Yaobang was a great lover and, of well, Japan. Well, Hu Yaobang, right. I, so, would, I would differ on that. I think Deng Xiaoping was the one who started it because in, it was in the mid-80s when China opened its doors to do business with capitalist countries, including Japan. The, the hardliners, the nationalists in China, were very quick to pounce on Deng mm-hmm. for being soft on Japan and so on. And that's when the Nanking Museum plans to build a museum you there. You got the first so demonstration. He was the first one. Mm-hmm. Well, also, the first I, I feel deeply flattered by your words about my book, so I hesitate in taking I, issue. Did I got it wrong? <laughs> I, I, I think I said something slightly different. Okay. I, 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 and, and this goes back to the question of Pax Americana. I have to go back and reread no, it. No, uh, the, the, the Pax Americana was founded on the, on the, both in the West and in East Asia on how to deal with the former enemies, Japan and Germany. In the case of Germany, in West <coughs> Germany at least, it wasn't very difficult because there was a, a consensus in Germany and in, amongst the Allies that Hitler had been a bad thing, the Nazis had to be purged, and once you'd done that, West Germany could become a Western democracy and so on. Uh, and so the Nazis and Hitler and the SS and so on were, were held responsible quite rightly, and once you got rid of them, Germany became become a normal country. In the case of Japan, it was never that simple because there was no Hitler and there were no Nazis. And so they had to come up with a different uh, answer to what had gone wrong in Japan. And it was militarism and the samurai and all that. So Japan had to be made into a pacifist country. That meant that Japan was politically divided uh, from the very beginning, from 1945. And so as long as the Japanese liberals, who were the majority... Uh, agreed with the Allied interpretation of Japan that it, it was had a deeply flawed militarist <laughs> culture and so on and so like an al- alcoholic should be kept away from such dangerous toys as tanks and battleships and so on, couldn't be trusted with that kind of thing. As long as they said, well look what we did during the war so we need a pacifist constitution, those on the right who wanted to revise the pacifist constitution had to use historical arguments to make their claim and say, no, 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 uh, uh, of course we did bad things in the war but every country did and every country has had wars, there was nothing especially atrocious about ours, these things happened, we should be trusted again to be a sovereign power. And so a, a deep political division that started because of what MacArthur and the Americans put in place with, with Japanese liberals in 1945, a, a political problem or a historical problem became a political problem in the way it never, ha- never uh, was in Germany. That sort of was what I was trying to say. And I've been praised uh, um, by many people, including you, for saying the opposite, but <laughs> that's sort of what I, what I meant to say. Well, I mean, if you going to Yasukuni Shrine... Um, you know, expecting to see it sort of through Chinese eyes. I ended up seeing it through American eyes and thinking, being totally horrified by the depiction of how the Americans basically caused, you know, the war, Second World War in the Pacific. Yeah, but well, yes, weren't, weren't you is not to, official um, Japanese policy. I mean, no. no. But weren't you able to change some of the exhibits in the Yushikan Museum? Was it you or another <laughs> U.S. Me, official who fought? Who, the yeah. Japanese actually changed some they of it for the U.S., change. but they didn't change it for China. But I saw it before it changed. Right. And yeah. I, you know, color, was, yeah. was amazed that in this, you know, in the... Uh, you know, late 20th century or mm. early 21st century. Actually, I didn't go till I was, I was no longer in government. I went right. afterwards. And so, um, in any case, and then when I was in Berlin at a meeting, experiencing what, how the Germans had, were educating each successive generation about what had happened during the war, and I was there with the Trilateral Commission and all these Japanese friends. And I said, well, how is it you feeling about this? You know, and we had a conversation. And every single Japanese said, well, it's all the fault of the Americans. You let us keep, you let us keep the emperor. Right. And I have heard this yeah. from... No, but the truth is, Germany came to terms with this not until the 1970s. That's yeah. also true. That's, that's it, it was also, not yeah. because right. of the Americans and the yeah. occupation. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, can, can I just make one yeah, point? Yeah, please, the, um, I'll read one quote from Mao, one of my favorite Mao quotes with a Japanese delegation in the 50s, which was very striking. 
He says, you cannot be asked to apologize every day, can you? It's not good for a nation to feel constantly guilty and we can understand this point. Now, of course, that's not the kind of quote you see foregrounded in Chinese you know, school textbooks these days. But having said that, I think that uh, you know, dictate from Mao. Mao didn't want the Japanese to, didn't want to talk about the war for all sorts of geopolitical reasons. I don't think that ever sat well with the Chinese people. And Mao had more to apologize for than any Japanese yeah. leader. Yeah, and, and on top of that, but I don't think it ever sat well with the Chinese people, and um, uh, and that's why once the 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 party started talking about the war and started talking about the Nanjing massacre, it was never talked about in the fifties. Uh, it struck a chord. I mean, you can see Chinese civil groups in 1960 in Nanjing doing, doing research. So I think it was always there amongst, you know, the, the Chinese as it would have been, memories of war. That's the same as in any country. But in some ways, the Chinese leadership suppressed it, and then they turn it up rapidly. Oh, and, and you can see the healthy. generations, though, younger Chinese are more anti-Japanese than older mm. ones. So um, younger Chinese are less anti-American than older ones, but they are more anti-Japanese, and that's because they've been, it's been taught. Mm -hmm. You so know, it's the, not memories of absolutely. the war. It's been kind of constructed. Well, if you watch Chinese television, I mean, any night on Chinese television, there are four or five, six films about China, fighting the Japanese during the war. And of course, it really was not the communists, it was the Kuomintang who bore the lion's share and the Americans. And yet this is, so, I mean, clearly these history wars are very much alive. The Yasukuni Shrine is a kind of a, a radioactive core uh, for this, this issue. So what's the remedy? It's very hard. I mean, Yasukuni was deliberately, if you like, it's all sort of insider Japanese politics. Um, you know, there was a, when the ch a, a new chief priest took over, I think, in about 1978, who was captive of the conservatives, very right wing. Uh, it was his decision to intern the uh, eight or however many uh, class A war shrine, criminals think, there in the shrine. Uh, in shrine, not in shrine. Intern. 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 I don't I think they were alive yeah. there. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Uh, um, and shrine, <laughs> and, but they're um, not actually there. No, no, no. no, no, no they're no, simply no. Have no. Names they're spirits. Their spirits, their spirits yeah. are there because they liberated um, Asia. Virtual enshrinement, and they knew exactly what they were doing because they never announced it at the time. It didn't come out until later that it had actually happened. So th these people knew what they were doing was sensitive, and they knew what they were doing was you know, of some moment. Um, and ever since then, it's been impossible to unwind. Uh, Jap Japan resents being, um, you know, talked at over history like other countries do. Uh, all these sorts of proposals have come up for a, a separate war memorial outside of Yaskuni to somehow you can have the war criminals here and, you know, our Japanese dead in war there. But it's never, you know, there's a sort of tight little bit of kryptonite in the Japanese system that, you know, nobody's been able to touch. Um, and as Susan said, and I agree with her, it's too late now. Mm. You know, all the apologetic gestures are political constructs. And Abe, I think, has finally got clever about handling this, but he's handled it looking at Washington to try and, you know, Obama gave... I've got a lot of detail in my book about, you know, Obama lecturing Abe to fix this issue because it was a geopolitical problem for yeah. the US. So he's fixed it with Washington, but he hasn't fixed it in South Korea, even though, to his credit, he finally made it an effort on comfort women and stopped talking about them being, you know, Japan hardly done by on that. So he made an effort with, he fixed it with uh, the US, made an effort with South Korea, but with China, it's just the sitting there like a peat bog. Well, wasn't you know, Maruyama's away. apology enough? I mean, well, exactly. Well the, well, the, well, the Maruyama apology in 1995 was a big deal um, and, I mean, a little bit undercut by a bit of unapologizing, but it was a big deal. But, you know, it, you know the, um, there was a great, great quote, I think, from uh, former one of the old LDP king mate, makers, Takeshita, who said, uh, I have it written down, I think he said, um, he once said, we can apologize as much as China wants. It's free, and very soon China will become tired of asking for apologies. Um, but of course, they didn't get tired of it, and they haven't, and they won't. But there is a solution, I think. 
Speak. which is that um, if the Japanese were to revise their constitution and become a uh, sovereign power that can, with the right to take care of its armed forces and, take, and, and, and use them in combat and so on, like any other country, it would take the politics out of this, the, or history out of, or the politics out of a historical discussion. The problem is that Abe is the last person to do this because Abe himself is a revisionist and a nationalist and so on, and, and wants to change the constitution from a pacifist to, an, to a, a different one, for all the wrong reasons. His argument is we didn't do anything wrong in the war. Well, that's not the argument, not the way to do it. What you would need is a more liberal government in Japan that, after a proper discussion, a political debate can no normalize uh, the situation in, in Japan so that it can be a responsible power with its uh, armed forces that it could actually use if necessary. It's got to come from the and left. That, it would have to come from the left, and that would undercut the right-wing arguments of sort of, we did nothing wrong in the war, mm -hmm. because it would no longer have any purpose. It's like Nixon recognizing China. In a way. You yeah. need someone from the But this is not going to ha happen yeah. very soon. All right, uh, we're going to get the questions from you. And let's start with you, Richard. Some nice thought to glide us into the question period. Uh, on, on what issue? <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I didn't, uh, what do you want me to? I just, to, I just wanted to give yeah. you a chance to yeah. kind of do a little uh, coda here. Uh, I'll just, I think we should just take questions. All right. What do you think? Yeah. So now, uh, yeah. please raise your hands uh, and we will <coughs> pass a microphone so that we can get you on the webcast. Uh, yes, let's start right up here in the front. It's been an excellent general discussion. Jerry, introduce yourself. Oh, uh, all Jerry you Cohen do. from NYU and part-time at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, it's been a very fine background discussion and general principles, etc. But now we have to face the future. And my question concerns some of the major flashpoints that we have to confront and what are the prospects for reconciliation between China and Japan when confronted by the necessity of facing the North Korean immediate crisis, South China Sea, East China Sea problems, and the one I think is getting too little attention, understandably, because of the others, but is going to be very serious before the end of the Xi Jinping administration, and that's Taiwan. Uh, if you really are looking for a serious problem to divide Japan and China and the U.S. and Japan on one side, it's Taiwan. But I'd love to hear people address these specific questions and what are the implications. Well, well, let's start with General. you, Richard. And then, of course, you know, not to be a Taiwan. I mean, India has Arunachal Pradesh, which is the size of the state of Texas, which China claims we've heard very little about. But when that begins to come online, we're going to have a whole other altercation of rather monumental proportions. Richard. I mean, there's lots in that uh, question. I mean, part of the thesis of my book is that all the sort of frozen in the 50s conflicts, the Korean Civil War has never been solved, the Chinese Civil War has never been solved, Sino-Japanese relations are maybe the worst they've been for decades. Um, uh, once these were papered over, relatively speaking, by the stupendous economic success of the region. But, you know, you can argue it's been a political failure, but that's all coming home to roost now. I don't know which uh, of those issues is going to come to a head first. You know, I should have thrown North Korea into the title of my book and I, it would have lifted sails. But my, I've got a bit of North Korea in there, but it's not fundamental to it. You say Taiwan is going to come up under Xi Jinping. Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of talk about that in 2021. Uh, uh, I just don't know. But that's a, that's a very... They're all dangerous issues. Maybe longer term... I, I don't know how to, how to grade them, actually. Taiwan, maybe. People forget the Japanese and Taiwanese have a very good relationship. The Taiwanese like the Japanese. Um, and uh, there's a great deal of support within... Japan, uh, the LDP for Taiwan, and they're even talking in Japan still these days about having their own Taiwan Relations Act. So that's a bit of a sleeper. But it's, um, you know, the front burner right now is the DPRK, and that's obviously very important for the sorts of military reform that Ian talked about. 
China is the big thing which helps Abe push through, change through. I think North Korea is obviously the accelerant. Either of you two want to comment on Jerry's question? Well, I think um, Japan, in working the North Korea problem, has always been a little bit marginal compared with China and the United States and South Korea, and even Russia. So now I think, wasn't someone just saying that Abe is speaking with Putin about it, yeah. but he's not speaking to Xi Jinping about it. I, uh, for one thing, there's no good communication channel. They meet very infrequently. And secondly, I think Abe thinks that probably he is the last person whose advice Xi Jinping would like to hear on what to do on North Korea. So uh, the prospect of cooperating on that issue, in fact, I mean, my perception is that, unfortunately, approach to North Korea, we now see a split between Russia and China taking one approach and the United States and South Korea and Japan taking a very different approach. So it's looking a lot more Cold War-like than we, for a decade, we had the five countries really trying to find a common approach to solve the problem, but we don't see that today. Uh, next question. Let's see. Uh, there's someone in the back. Uh, hand up. Uh, yes. My question actually addressed uh, in, in the previous question. It's Brian Kelly with Asian Century Quest. <clears throat> Several of you alluded to this this of um, Shoshinism or perhaps Confucian values as it pertains to the, the role of hierarchy in the region. I think this is underappreciated and remains, I, I strongly believe, having spent a, a, a significant period of time in the region, that it remains a major impediment to these countries getting on in the future. And China's, the perception of China proceeding as a hegemon, whether it's realistic in a, in a medium-term outlook or not, is certainly pervasive in, in Japan. In, in my opinion, <clears throat> I guess my question is: In that con, if this sort of vassal state uh, that China may may desire, many of the other countries in the region comes to pass, where does North Korea fit in, in in this solution? And how are the Chinese going to relate to North Korea in its in its present state, ten to twenty years from now? You have a chapter on Asian values, Richard, uh, and sort of hierarchy. The Asian values, you know, I mean, it's, you know, why, why does America need to be in Asia at all? Um, uh, uh, you know, when, when Japan was the leading country in Asia uh, and they started to talk about Asian values, well, China wasn't very interested in that. Uh, when China became the sort of leading power in Asia, and they started talking about Asian values, Asia for Asians. The Japanese weren't, suddenly weren't very interested in it. Uh, there's been many ways this has been looked at over the past um, 20, 30 years. Um, well, actually, longer than that, but in recent politics. Um, uh, uh, the Singapore was an incubator of this sort of theory of Asian values where everybody could get along because it was somehow organic to their cultures or societies, which is obviously nonsense. Um, uh, Mahatia uh, used to talk, try to get a, an Asians only sort of uh, regional organization that was the so called East Asia Caucus, which was the caucus without Caucasians. Some of you will remember that. Um, uh, but none of, n none of these have really uh, worked um, because they simply uh, are at different stages of development or don't trust each other, or because, you know, as countries which we lump together as Asia, uh, they're very different. Um, and it's, it's never come together. As to North Korea, uh, I don't know where North Korea will be in 20 years. In 20 years, Kim Jong-un will only be 53, you know. <laughs> so, probably a grandfather. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we, we don't know where North Korea will be in six months to a year. Um, so it's, but you know, you know we, I think we all know China and North Korea don't get on, they haven't for a long time. They distrust each other as well. And that, but that, anyway, that's a whole other story. So how do you all come down on the question of China as sort of the new central kingdom linchpin of Asia, the hegemon of Asia? Do you all think that that sort of historical memory is shaping China's view? Let's start with you, Ian. 
I think to some extent inevitably, yeah. And, and the, 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 the base of modern Chinese education uh, is uh, a, a nationalism based on the idea of humiliation, of a hundred years of humiliation at the hands of foreigners. Um, the British uh, in the mid-19th century and then, the, of course, the Japanese <coughs> in the 20th century. And so people, are edu- ed- d- several generations have already been educated with the idea we have to make sure this never happens again. We have to be powerful enough that no foreign power can ever challenge us again and, and, and humiliate us, as has happened in the past. Um, and the only way that can be done is according to the official propaganda, is under the, the firm leadership of the Communist Party. And, but I think that does echo um, uh, a sense of superiority, of a natural order of things. Um, and uh, other countries have to li- find some way to live with this or accommodate themselves to it. Mm-hmm. I think I already said that I... I, I, the Chinese might like to do that, but I don't think it's possible for them to reestablish that kind of hierarchy. And that they are, I mean, you see a lot of resistance to China every place they go, frankly. And, um, and these are large, powerful countries it's surrounded by. It's, it's not, not like the United States and the Caribbean or something, you know. I mean, it's. No, I mean, some people make that argument that, of course, China wants a Monroe Doctrine. Of course, they want to dominate their environment. That's what international relations theory would predict, and you know, or Chinese history, the history of Asia would predict. But it's not. You know, there are important countries that will balance and react against it, even if the U.S. role is diminished. Um, no, I think that covers up there. Yeah. Can I add just one thing? Yeah. I think it depends a lot. I mean, we've been talking a lot about culture and history and emotions and that kind of thing. It also depends on, on how countries perceive their interests. And if China economically um, becomes more and more dominant, uh, the Vietnamese may all, always have a problem with China emotionally. Mm -hmm. But most countries in Southeast Asia and East Asia depend more and more on the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. Their interests are with China. And so even without the Chinese coercing them, inevitably um, they will bow to China in many ways. Sorry? Some gravity, some economic gravity. The Philippines. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Thailand. There's one funny point about this, you know, countries where I'm from, Australia, South Korea. Australia and South Korea are the two countries most dependent on China as a market. Uh, Japan's economy is also tremendously dependent on China, China much less so on Japan. So countries like Japan and uh, Australia and Singapore are now uh, building up their defence budgets in theory to defend themselves against a rising China, but to fund their defence budgets they need China to continue to succeed. And I haven't worked out whether this is a virtuous or a vicious circle yet, but it's uh, where that takes us. I've forgotten you're the only Asian on this panel. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't it obvious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't want to be racist about these things. Uh, there's a woman right here who has a question at the microphone. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> economics. Uh, identify with, yourself, please. Yeah, Joyce Slayton Mitchell. I work in China with, I'd say, 17 year olds through 20 year olds most of the time in um, talking about higher education in America. Um, the young people love to go to Japan from China. They like to study there. They like to have their holidays there. They spend a lot of travel money in Japan. And they don't, once they have money, they don't pay attention to what the history books say. Um, Not at all, actually. And, of course, if anybody's lived in China, we also acknowledge they don't pay any attention to the government. I saw a great big picture of Trump and Xi Jinping, their first meeting ever in all the newspapers in China. And I'd say to the Chinese 25 and 30 year olds professional, oh look, the two leaders are getting together and they they just, you know, go on to the next thing that they want to talk about. But my, my question to all of you is, 
What about the economics in the Belt Road um, initiative? China does feel like the biggest guy on the block in terms of numbers and economy going up. Japan's economy, I thought, was going down to nothing, and heaven's knows there's no birth rate. So what's to be afraid of Japan? I don't understand that. Well, certainly there are some people in China who've written off Japan. Uh, it's still the world's third largest economy. It will be for some time. Yeah, they've got a massive demographic problems, but actually so does, so does every country in East Asia. China does, South Korea does, Taiwan does. They're all going to have falling populations, so they're all going to have similar problems. On the other point you talk about, about tourism to Japan, that's very interesting. There is a boom of Chinese tourism to Japan. Uh, at the moment, and it's, I think it's, it's a great thing, actually. Um, and one thing that was very inter interesting for me in researching my book, at the early stages, I, I went round systematically and talked to every Chinese expert on Japan in Beijing, and um, uh, the, the, a wide variety of views and on, on different issues. But one thing they nearly all complained about was the incessant use of the, the propaganda term to describe Japan about Japanese militarism. And one thing that Chinese will see if they go to Japan is that the, you couldn't go to a less militaristic country unless you think every salary man, you know, working for Mitsubishi is, you know, a little soldier uh, in a blue suit or something. <laughs> but so the personal interaction might be quite significant, but I've got to say it runs against all the polling over a long time of how Chinese feel about Japan and how Japanese feel about the Chinese. It's gone from extremely positive in the early 80s to extremely negative now. One final point, your students may not care much about the government, but I'm sure the government cares about them uh, when they go overseas. And it's, I think, worth pointing out that a lot of Chinese tourists once were going to Korea, and now with uh, China penalizing Korean companies. Not only are Korean stores shut down in China, there's a huge cutback on flights to Seoul. They're, mm -hmm. they're really punishing Seoul and uh, making it very difficult for that tourist flow, which, which Korea had come to mm -hmm. count on. Uh, and even Hyundai sales in China. Yes, mm -hmm. the factories are closed down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, way in the back there, right by the door. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, at least there's a new, new slogan. They don't have Dada uh, anymore for America. <laughs> and uh, the question in your book about the Communist Party that you wrote, Mr. McGregor, what, uh, do you know how, Ch how Chinese foreign policy is made? Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the inputs? Who, will there be a change of the 19th Party Congress? Do people from the military, the PLA, get together? Is there a permanent uh, group of people giving input? Do they have think tanks like we have who talk to party officials? How is it actually formulated? How is it cooked? Uh, how does it keep continuity? At what point does the, does the agreement, uh, or the, uh, the, the harmony uh, change and they decide they're gonna do something else? Can you give us some, some insight into that regard, especially regarding Japan? When did this start? What, what, were, the, uh, what were the touchstones? What, what little hints uh, suddenly emerged that you can analyze that said, let's go have this, uh, you know, f uh, attack Japan type of uh, attitude, and what would, what would stop it? Well, Thank well, you. Well, Susan will have something to say about policy making in China as well. Uh, I mean, you know, in a technical way, the, it's the Communist Party leading group on foreign affairs which makes policy. Uh, Xi Jinping is the head of that. Uh, usually the foreign minister and the state councillor for f uh, foreign affairs sit on that, but I don't think they're very pivotal. Um, it's very hard to know what uh, uh, is pivotal in a particular policy at a different time mm. and why it changes. It depends on the strength of the leader. Xi Jinping is a very strong leader, very decisive. Hu Jintao was much weaker, but then again Hu Jintao was leading a much less powerful country. There's all sorts of uh, variables. Um, the, you know, the, there is a sense in some ways in China, maybe less so in the last two years because of the way that Xi Jinping has constricted debate, that the number of voices, including public voices on foreign policy, had widened uh, to the military, um, who are often on TV, um, 
Uh, public opinion, it's very hard to measure public opinion and calibrate its importance, particularly on Japan, you know. Is, is the party scared of the people or uh, can the party sort of turn off anti-Japanese sentiment when they want? I lean to the latter, but it's an open question. Um, and academics and scholars. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the, the divergence now on North Korea with a lot of scholars being quite openly critical of, the ch of Chinese policy and supporting uh, cutting North Korea loose. So far it's had no visible impact on policy itself. Um, it's hard to pin it all down to one person, but I don't think anything changes dramatically or fundamentally at the moment in China uh, without Xi Jinping's say-so. Um, anyway, that's a bit garbled. Susan, you've done, written about this. Well, I think um, under the previous leader, Hu Jintao, there, uh, what we saw was the foreign ministry becoming less and less central to the foreign policy process and lots of different bureaucratic interest groups getting involved so that, for example, in North Korea policy, you have uh, certain Communist Party organizations that have a strong sentimental attachment for fellow communists in, uh, in Pyongyang. And the military also having a, a sense of uh, comradely support for North Korea because they fought in the Korean War together and this kind of thing. And then in the South China Sea, we also, on those issues, we saw, you know, a number of different bureaucracies, including fisheries, Coast Guard, marine surveillance. So it, it became a, a really a more pluralistic system, but bureaucratic pluralism, not you know, uh, uh, democratic pluralism. But under Xi Jinping, he, he was critical of that, and he's tried to get control of all of those strings so that they all go to him and his advisors. But the actual decision-making process is very opaque. We don't really know in what uh, body and uh, decisions get made. Do they get made in the leading small group or just in Xi Jinping's office? We really don't know. You know, we do want to take a, one or two more questions, but before the evening is out, we've not w once uttered the word Trump. And of course, in this we equation... Started. Yeah, well, yeah. well, maybe yeah. we had a brief <laughs> flirtation, but uh, it, it seems to me that's a pretty critical variable in, in everything we've been talking about. But let's, let's see. Um, one more question right here. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Yong Hwan Kim from South Korean Country General in New York. Actually, you know, I deeply agree with you that, you know, the Japanese apology is too late. We don't expect any sincere apology from Japan. But nevertheless, I think South Korea has to cooperate with Japan in dealing with China, in dealing with North Korea and everything else. So what would be your recommendation for South Korea in dealing with Japan? You know, how, how should we uh, you know, de deal with Japan? We have, do we have to keep suggesting Japan to, add, uh, to start some kind of apology or just let history be history? What is your recommendation? I frankly think I'll be asking you for a recommendation, not, <laughs> not, 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 not the other way around. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, the... the Abe and Madam Park uh, turned the temperatures down on that issue and made a deal on relating to comfort women, so-called. Um, uh, that's appeared to unravel a little bit with the election of President Moon. Uh, right now, obviously, Japan and South Korea have uh, um, other issues to cooperate on, um, uh, which for the Americans, I think, is just what they want. Uh, I think the U.S. is desperate for uh, Japan and South Korea to cooperate. Uh, you would know far better than me, but dealing with Japan in South Korean domestic politics is very difficult. There's been a number of deals which have been done on security dialogue which right. have fallen apart uh, once somebody makes a fuss about it. Uh, but I can understand South Korean sentiment because if you go into Japanese bookshops and like these days, there's all sorts of odd anti-Korean stuff which I really don't understand, but it's all still there in one part of the Japanese psyche. 
but I guess at the end of the day, you know, you're going to cooperate with Japan if you have an interest to do so, and hopefully through that you build more ballast which, so you can manage the sort of inevitable um, you know, uh, uh, pressure you get from the domestic politics on the issue. Can I give you an answer that you won't like? <laughs> which is that I don't think the Koreans themselves have really dealt with their history adequately yet, which is that Korea is almost as polarized about the past as Japan is, but, and it's just as political, which, mean, which is to say that the large parts of the Korean elite, I don't have to lecture you on this, but large parts of the Korean elite collaborated with the Japanese during the Japanese empire. And whenever a leftist in Korean politics wants to get back at a, at a conservative, this history comes up and it's used to purge conservatives and that kind of thing and then not, not just the people who themselves collaborate with the Japanese but their children and their grandchildren are still blamed for this and, it, and it's still a political issue in Korea so I don't think it's as simple as to say Korea victim Japan aggressor how can the Koreans possibly forgive the Japanese how can the Japanese apologize enough to the Koreans there's a real problem in Korea about history and I don't think it's yet been adequately resolved and I'm not saying that blaming the Koreans for this because it's a very difficult thing you could, that you could argue that the same thing is true in Italy and in Greece and so on these things go on but it's not just a question of one how one country deals with another country it's also a domestic issue mm -hmm. plus of course there's been three deals between Japan and South Korea yeah. which have in theory irrevocably settled all issues 1965 when the reparations money was paid by Japan and uh, President Park. Who was a you, collaborator, of course. He was a colonel in Manchuria in the Japanese army. And he spent it, he didn't give it to the Korean people. He, gave, he spent it on Pusan Steel, uh, setting up the steel company. Uh, 1998, with Kim Dae-jong, there was another deal, which, of course, was very controversial with China. And, of course, we had another one with uh, Abe and Park as well, and that's unravelling a bit. So... It's hot. Now, we're, cu we're coming to the end, and I, I don't want to let the question of America drift from this discussion, because I do think we have suddenly entered all of these problems in a new and, and very catalytic way. And I just wonder what each of you anticipates. Uh, I guess it's too much to ask for an analysis of something that, which is very hard to predict. But let's start with you, Ian. I mean, no, no, start with uh, Richard. He's the star. <laughs> uh, let's start with Richard. He's, he's the, the man. No, I think now. if you look at, uh, I think the, the contrast is uh, greater with, greatest with China. You know, in, and I, you know, well, I should all be brief now. But, you know, in China now, you have the most powerful uh, Chinese leader uh, in generations uh, in charge of a China which is more powerful than it's been maybe for 100 years, whatever. Not only on top of that, you've got the most disciplined Chinese leader. And consistent in a way. Yeah, and in the White House, you've got the most ill-disciplined <laughs> president uh, in charge of a White House which is increasingly weak and which various U.S. institutions in the Pentagon, the State Department, are trying to keep him moored to um, past practices and alliances and commitments. And so I think that trend line, we, you know, Xi Jinping could slip up, but that's a very worrying... Uh, contrast, not just for the U.S., but for U.S. allies. Susan, yeah, I want to hear your remarks, but also maybe address what you think Xi Jinping, how he, you think he ought to deport himself towards Trump and America now. Oh, gosh. I mean, he's really, uh, you know, I think he's played Trump very well. Uh, and there's, uh, but... He's trying to, he's kind of joined in the effort that everybody's engaged in, in trying to kind of put him in a box and act like he is really the president and following, you know, carrying out long-held U.S. policy. He, he's trying not to embarrass him, for one thing, and not to publicly attack him because we know that he gets provoked when he's publicly attacked in the media. So, you know, uh, I think he's kind of walking on eggs very carefully to handle them as best he can. And planning for this visit now, this state visit, is I, I just don't know who, how they're going to do it, because 
uh, on the U.S. side, you know, we don't really have the people to do this. Uh, Kushner and Ivanka are now not going because I believe that Mr. Kelly must have said, look, we're going to prepare this summit and the proper authorities are going to do it. And that means the senior director at the NSC or some other folks at the NSC. Uh, so it's, it's a really uh, a very difficult situation. And normally we want the leaders to get together early and often. In this case, I'm not so sure. Uh, because, you know, at Mar-a-Lago, we lost a great opportunity at Mar-a-Lago. We just sort of threw it all away. We had a lot of leverage. We didn't use it. And um, I think that was pretty much it. I mean, it could have been worse, I guess. <laughs> but, I mean, it could have been some kind of crisis in U.S.-China relations. But we have very real problems in the United States that we're not pursuing with China. Uh, so I'm concerned. I mean, the fact that a great power like the United States has to rely on Ivanka and Jared Kushner to deal with... <laughs> China is in itself, of course. Well, they're not going, so that's No, no, but I mean, the whole the idea. And uh, the problem that, that uh, the Americans uh, traditionally, especially in the 80s, people complained about this, and you'd know more, much more about this from your own experience than, than I do. But dealing with Japan was always you never really knew where the center of power was. Yeah. Everything was hidden behind somebody else. Was it Miti? Was it the prime minister? Whatever the prime minister said didn't really matter because it was, nobody really knew. It was a system of, of sometimes described a system of irresponsibilities. But And the U.S., at least, you had a pretty fair idea of how things work. You don't anymore, because where is the center of power now? Is it the tweets that come out of the White House? Is it Tillerson, who doesn't seem to know very much more about these countries than, than, than his president? Is it, is it McMaster? Is it Congress, who are more and more left to mm. deal with foreign policy, which is also an absurdity? So um, uh, one of the, 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 the uh, fears I have is that um, McMaster and, and um, Mattis are uh, sort of there and probably, and I was told in Washington, the, the understanding is that they have to be there to make sure that the president doesn't do something truly insane, so that, that the armed forces would obey the uh, Secretary of Defense rather than the White House. But once a great democracy has to rely on generals to keep it safe, we're on our way to becoming Argentina. And um, this has consequences for our relations in Asia as well, because we could blunder into wars. And then you have to, you know, wonder the president talking about the trade agreement with South Korea at a time when, yeah. right after the sixth nuclear test. And I mean, it's. But then somebody else will contradict it, him. That was dropped two days later. Well, that's yeah. the thing. But you know, if we go down this road, we'll be here all yeah. night. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me just recommend this. Really, it's, it's a, this is a book I enjoyed as much as any book I've read of late. So I, Richard's done a wonderful job. Yeah. It yeah, is yeah. Uh, available to you all outside, and Richard will be signing it. So join me in thanking our three panelists.